All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Dr. Mark Strand, and I'm presenting the representing the NDSU Department of Public Health Seminar Series. I have the honor of introducing Dr. Paul Carson, who will be presenting his topic, Religion and Spirituality as a Social Determinant of Health, Clinical and Public Health Implications. Dr. Carson is an infectious disease physician with 25 years of clinical experience caring for patients with complicated infectious disease. Prior to coming to NDSU in 2013, he had roles at Sanford Health, including Chair of the Department of Infectious Disease, Director of Clinical Research, and Chief Quality Officer. He's currently a professor in the University of North Dakota School of Medicine and Health Sciences and a professor of practice in the NDSU Department of Public Health, where he founded and serves as Medical Director for the Center for Immunization Research and Education. Welcome, everyone, and good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you are. I know we have people from uh, different geographic locations, which we're very glad to have a wide um, and diverse audience. Um, so today I'm going to talk about uh, this topic of religion and spirituality as a social determinant of health. <clears throat> and I'm going to first just kind of rearrange my screen here a little bit so I can uh, share my content with you. Hopefully that is coming through okay. Do you see that, uh, Dr. Strand? Yeah, it looks great. Okay, yeah. great. So um, just by way of starting on this, I'll, I'll go over my outline here of what I hope to accomplish in this hour with you. So I want to just very briefly um, review some of the historical connection of religion's role in healthcare and background for some of the current issues. I'll need to go over a few definitions, particularly as they pertain to the research literature on this. And then a good uh, portion of what I want to talk about with you today is um, the current research regarding um, an association between spirituality and health and review some of the possible explanations for this association. And then I'd like to finish uh, with some of the implications that I think are important for both people who work in healthcare and in public health. So historically, at least in the West, uh, there's been a very intimate connection between um, religion and uh, health and the delivery of health care. Um, out of the uh, religious orders and monastic orders in the um, Middle Ages, uh, came the birth of the hospice movement, uh, where caring for the sick and dying um, was a regular part of uh, the vocations of some religious orders. And that even uh, moved into uh, the more modern era with many, uh, if not most, of our hospitals and healthcare systems either currently still having or having had a history of some uh, religious affiliation. <clears throat> Uh, if you want to see, a, I think, an excellent sort of story on this, I, I encourage you to watch the Ken Burns documentary on the formation of the Mayo Clinic. All of Ken Burns' documentaries are really fantastic. Um, this It's a remarkable story of the coming together of the Mayo brothers and the Franciscan nuns who lived in Rochester, Minnesota, uh, to develop that healthcare system there in the wake of a very devastating tornado that um, uh, damaged much of Rochester and caused a, a lot of uh, injury and death. Um, and, and the sort of marriage between the sort of science of the Mayo brothers who were at the forefront of healthcare and the uh, mission of health and healing uh, of the Franciscan sisters is, is a remarkable story that's worth watching. But if we kind of look now today into the 21st century, we know that um, we, we've, we, we literally have had sort of what appear to be almost like miracles of uh, diagnostics and therapeutics that have made um, healthcare uh, a, a fantastic um, uh, enterprise of the biomedical sciences. But I think we also uh, increasingly recognize that, that, that those successes and the uh, increasing emphasis of the biomedical approach to healthcare has left some feeling um, out of touch in, in that we have um, what is being increasingly perceived as a mechanized, compartmentalized um, uh, delivery of healthcare that does not look at the whole person. Um, uh, a person uh, that I that I, I think is worth uh, reading uh, some of his work is Dr. Eric Cassell. He was an internist who uh, later moved into the area of public health and in particular into the area of bioethics. He's one of the forefathers of the palliative care movement and um, did a lot of work in um, uh, end of life uh, care. And, and he noted that um, in this quote here that everyone has a transcendent dimension. Uh, what he says is a life of the spirit, the quality of being greater and more lasting than an individual life gives this aspect to the person its timeless dimension. 
The profession of medicine appears to ignore this, appears to ignore the human spirit. And he was sort of decrying this uh, lack of attention and lack of um, uh, expertise in this area. Yet we know that concerns that involve both medicine and spirituality frequently overlap. Um, things like loss, mortality, our dignity, hope, um, feelings of isolation and its converse, connection, things like existential meaning and purpose, things like closure and legacy, and then what happens to us after we die, touch upon both areas of uh, spirituality and medicine. Um, <clears throat> and just kind of by way of background further here, acknowledging that religion and spirituality have played this traditional role in healthcare, yet we, we I think, increasingly recognize that science and the biomedical model have largely supplanted and maybe even marginalized or ignored this relationship. It is, it is more often said or at least implied that faith is a personal matter, a private matter, not something that really concerns um, medicine. <clears throat> Yet there is a, a re-emerging and growing interest in trying to break through this sort of wall. Um, there is an increasing recognition, as I mentioned, that modern healthcare is compartmentalized and can be, in many times, uh, dehumanizing. <clears throat> There's increasingly a quest for meaning and more holistic care amongst people who are receiving or consuming health care. And there's an increased recognition of what I'm going to be talking about more today, which is the growing, the growing scientific evidence of the connection between health and spirituality. So first, by way of backdrop, a little bit about some of the uh, sort of spiritual landscape, if you will, in the United States, taken from various studies and more particularly survey data. If we look at the most recent Gallup poll in 2022, uh, we find that about 81% of the U.S. population believes in God. About 72% consider religion of um, considerable importance in their lives. Other older studies have uh, shown that more patients than physicians believe in a higher being. When asked, most patients regard their spiritual health uh, as being as important as their physical health and would say that they pray daily. Um, other studies have shown that ill people would like their spiritual needs met. Yet, um, several studies have shown that spiritual needs are rarely, if ever, discussed or met. For example, in one study, only 28% of cancer patients, people well, you think they might be particularly thinking about end-of-life issues, say that their spiritual concerns were addressed at all. And um, the, this sort of uh, landscape differs uh, somewhat by race. If you look at um, race and ethnicity, um, we find that uh, in the dark blue and medium kind of colored blue here, that Blacks and Latinos uh, have uh, greater certainty about belief in God than do uh, Caucasians and Asians. And so there's, there's differences in the, uh, in the, um, by race and ethnicity. When you look at, at patient preferences, <clears throat> um, this was a, a study that looked at uh, an outpatient survey of six academic medical centers across three different states, um, surveying patients in these outpatient settings. In there, they found that two-thirds of the patients felt physicians should be aware of their spiritual beliefs. Uh, a third, um, a substantial minority, wanted to be asked about religious beliefs during routine office visits. And that spiritual interaction was desired more as acuity increased. For example, 19% actually wished they could have prayer with their physician during an office visit, 29% during hospitalization, and half in near-death scenarios. I'm not getting going to get into the... Um, Details about, you know, prayer with healthcare providers, that that's a, can be a whole separate talk and has a number of issues in and of itself. But just to be aware of where our patients uh, are at in their uh, hopes and wishes and desires. When you look at healthcare workers, uh, this is a study looking at uh, healthcare worker attitudes in a critical care setting uh, on addressing spiritual concerns. And so surveying attending physicians, uh, fellows in training, nurses, and advanced practice providers most, uh, when asked, would agree that addressing spiritual concerns is important, um, 80 to 90 percent, nurses being um, uh, the highest uh, group uh, saying that these needs should be met. Yet, when asked uh, if they frequently address those spiritual concerns in this high acuity setting, intensive care unit, uh, precious few uh, uh, can answer a yes to this. Again, nurses being the most, at maybe at best about 25 percent, saying they would frequently address spiritual concerns of their patients in that critical care setting. So um, 
getting now to the the next sort of uh, outline item on on religion and health, is there a link and what's the evidence? So first, it's important to have some definitions because the definitions matter when it pertains to to the research research literature. Um, so uh, first is uh, spirituality. This comes from uh, the Latin word, which means for breath. Uh, this is typically talked about as being intangible elements of utmost importance and related to a person's sense of reality. Transcendent meaning is sort of transcendent being kind of an operative word in, in most definitions and their place or purpose in the universe. Religion comes from the Latin religio, uh, which means to bind fast. Uh, this is uh, most often defined as a particular expression of spiritual beliefs, often involving a code of ethics, sacred texts, stories, doctrines, and rituals and practices, and a way of perceiving the world. And then lastly is religiosity, um, which is uh, the, a measure of the level of involvement in religious practice. And it should be pointed out as I go through the, the research literature here that this is the most frequent uh, measure used. There are attempts to measure these other things with some standardized metrics, but religiosity is by far the most uh, often um, uh, uh, metric when talking about this. If you look at PubMed listings for articles related to religion, spirituality, and health, um, you can see that uh, Medline search shows really kind of an explosion in this literature starting in the mid-90s um, with increasing uh, uh, interest and increasing numbers of uh, publications, uh, particularly in the last decade. Newsweek had a cover story article a number of years ago on, uh, on this connection, is religion good medicine and why science is starting to believe. And now there are actually uh, numerous uh, major academic centers that have dedicated centers uh, researching and exploring these connections between uh, spirituality and health. <clears throat> um, Duke uh, has, was one of the first, has a, a large center and kind of one of the forefathers of, uh, of this kind of research. Um, Mich uh, Harvard uh, has, has a, a large program now, George Washington University, Berkeley University of Michigan, and I know there are actually many others as well. But these are a few of the more established and larger uh, places with centers dedicated to researching this. Uh, probably one of the, the uh, main pioneers in, in this area of research is Dr. Harold Koenig. He's uh, the director for the Center for Spirituality, uh, Theology, and Health at Duke University. He has a uh, board certification in both internal medicine and psychiatry. And he's now, I think, probably uh, well into his 70s, um, has been reaching, uh, researching in this area for the last a couple of decades and is the kind of main author uh, of a Oxford Handbook of Religion and Health, that is a compilation of this research literature um, that's now in its third edition um, and uh, brings, uh, brings a pretty rigorous uh, expertise and research methodology to this uh, um, line of uh, inquiry. As I said, this is now in its third edition. Dr. Koenig, a little over a decade ago um, uh, with his colleagues published a uh, systematic review of um, the evidence on religion, spirituality, in physical health, um, and then did a different one on religion and spirituality and mental health. I'll kind of just briefly kind of walk through these. In this uh, systematic review, uh, he found that um, there were about 19 st studies um, related to uh, outcomes uh, related to coronary heart disease, showing an inverse relationship between religious engagement and religious practice. 63% um, of the, these studies showing this uh, um, inverse relationship. 11 of the 13 studies showed improved cardiac reactivity or lowered inflammatory markers after cardiac surgery with uh, hypertension, about 39, what he uh, rated as high quality studies, 62% showing uh, lowered blood pressure, cerebrovascular disease, uh, almost half of high quality studies showing lower risk, more of a mixed picture with Alzheimer's disease and dementia, about eight out of 14 high quality studies or 57% reporting better cognitive function. However, notably, 21% actually uh, found worse uh, outcomes. So kind of a mixed picture there. Cancer, uh, about 12 out of 20 high quality studies or 60% showing lower risk or better outcomes with cancer. Um, the person who's kind of succeeded him, I, I, I would say as uh, being at the forefront of a lot of, a lot of this research is Dr. Tyler Vanderweel. Uh, Dr. Vanderweel is an Oxford trained research methodologist who was recruited by Harvard to run their Institute for Quantitative Social Science because he he brings a, 
great deal of expertise and um, research methodologic rigor um, to a, a kind of a difficult area to in applying uh, research and methodologic rigor in the in the social sciences. And now he's <clears throat> become the um, uh, he's he's become the director of a program there called the Human Flourishing Program. Um, Dr. Vanderweel uh, was um, uh, one of our Chali Institute uh, visiting scholars, I think, uh, a year or two ago uh, and spoke at NDSU. And he was also um, recruited by the North Dakota Department of Health under Governor Burgum to be a consultant to a panel of us that were looking at ways to improve health in the state of North Dakota. Uh, and his research focuses on what's called positivistic uh, research, like what, what things predict flourishing or better outcomes. And he's actually developed what's called a flourishing uh, metric. <clears throat> And his research uh, um, uh, focusing on, I'm just picking out one, there's many, many studies on this. Um, this is one of the better studies. This is a, a large prospective cohort study that's gone now over two decades called the Nurses Health Study. So it's a study of women, uh, women's health and looking at a plethora of um, uh, behaviors, uh, um, risk factors, et cetera, and then health outcomes over uh, a protracted period of time. Looking at this Nurses Health Study and um, and looking at one of these factors, religious service attendance, being less than once a week, once a week, or more than once a week, he found for <clears throat> cardiovascular mortality um, and for cancer-related mortality, substantial reductions um, in risk of death from those two outcomes um, in the group that had more than once uh, per week a religious attendance. Uh, this is about a 21 to 41% risk reduction. And in these studies, they, uh, because this is a prospective cohort study, they're able to adjust very well for other confounding variables like baseline health, uh, exercise, diet, uh, um, uh, and other risk factors. Um, other studies have looked at, uh, for example, diabetes management and religious belief. Um, and here's a, a few of those uh, in one of, the, uh, one of these studies, or two of these studies, African-American females with type 2 diabetes mellitus who are uh, more religious, uh, appeared to have better coping skills and manage their disease better. Religious belief was correlated strongly with better glycemic control. Um, however, it was noted that people who had problems with religious belief, uh, so this would be uh, people who struggled with um, God hates me or God's abandoned me or uh, past um, negative associations with religion, um, had the converse, had poor um, uh, physical and mental health associated with um, their diabetes management. There's a much greater body of evidence related to mental health. Um, again, Koenig in this 2012 review and then some other studies here um, in his systematic review of uh, 326 studies, uh, almost 80% of these showed that religious involvement was associated with greater well-being and happiness. In a meta-analysis of 147 studies, almost 100,000 study subjects showed significant inverse association between religiosity and depression. Um, interestingly, in a, a more recent study, um, uh, a prospective study of adult children uh, at very high risk for depression, so this is a strong family history uh, of depression, it showed that subjects who placed a high importance of religion had a 90% uh, reduced risk of major depression over 10 years. Again, this is a higher quality study, a prospective cohort study. Um, and they also follow these people with uh, serial MRI scans and found on a follow-up study that um, these people with greater um, uh, importance of religion in their lives had um, actually thicker areas of brain cortex on the MRI and areas that are correlated with uh, depression, such as the amygdala and hippocampus. Other studies have found that the chance of remission uh, from depression is greater and time to remission of depression is markedly less in those from who are more highly religious. And then um, a number of studies have actually shown less anxiety, better marital stability, less delinquency, and greater chances of overcoming substance abuse in those who are more religiously engaged. Um, now, uh, kind of looking at um, uh, other areas of mental health, particularly suicide, um, many people are familiar with the NHANES study, a long-standing uh, longitudinal um, uh, study that's uh, um, run by the CDC, again, looking at a number of different predictors of health or disease over time. Uh, found that people who uh, attended religious services uh, more frequently had substantially reduced risk of suicide over an 18-year follow-up. <clears throat> In a univariate analysis, it was a 94% uh, reduced risk. And then when adjusting for a number of other potential confounding variables, uh, that still held up at about a 68% uh, reduced risk of suicide over time. 
Uh, Dr. Vanderweel's group uh, has latched on to this nurses uh, health cohort study. Again, this is a, a study that started off with almost 90,000 nurses uh, over a couple decades ago, and I've been following them uh, over time, again, looking at a plethora of different um, uh, risk factors and habits uh, to predict uh, all kinds of different uh, good and bad uh, health outcomes over time. And here again, uh, looking at um, never versus uh, infrequent versus once per week versus more than once a week, uh, religious uh, service attendance, uh, there was a marked reduction in suicide risk in those who uh, regularly attended uh, religious services. Uh, Dr. Vanderweel brings an, a, another level of, um, a, of rigorous kind of adjustment for other potentially confounding variables. Um, so adjusting for demographic covariates, lifestyle factors, medical history, depressive symptoms, and social integration measures, uh, all of which can be confounders. Uh, a study that I, a, a, group, uh, a group that uh, did a study that I, I found kind of intriguing um, was uh, um, a group looking at uh, pain tolerance. And um, this isn't uh, re religiosity per se, but it was uh, um, in training people in different forms of meditation. And in, in this study, they recruited a bunch of college students and they randomized them to be trained in uh, a secular meditation, in a relaxation training, and a spiritual meditation. <laughs> and so, uh, and, and they had to actually prove their ability to kind of do these. They, they actually were trained over several weeks. The secular meditation had them uh, learn how to kind of sit and relax and, and uh, enter into a meditative state um, with kind of chanting the sort of mantra, like something like, I am at peace, or I am calm, or I feel good. <clears throat> um, the relaxation training is kind of typical relaxation where you try and sequentially relax the various muscles of your body, deep breathing and so on, um, a standardized kind of relaxation training. And then the spiritual meditation substituted the mantra for a spiritual uh, focus, which um, God is good, or God gives me peace, <clears throat> or um, God is merciful. Um, and so there was a, a focus on a, a higher being. For people who uh, weren't comfortable with that, they allowed them to um, substitute some some other name for the higher being um, or opt out. There was it turned out almost no one opted out of that that group. So the randomization held pretty well. <clears throat> what they and, and so this test they use for pain control is submersion of your hand in an ice bath and how long you can hold your hand in an ice bath. In the secular meditation, uh, they could hold it a, about 46 to 50 seconds. <clears throat> the, uh, the spiritual meditation group was able to hold it almost twice as long. Uh, almost 92 seconds. Um, uh, so, so a much a greater propensity to be able to uh, withstand this painful stimuli. They then followed up this study uh, with a re repeat study, kind of doing the same thing, this time assessing their ability to hold their hand in an ice bath before the training. This time they also added another uh, type of meditation, which was called external secular meditation, saying, well, maybe, the, maybe it's important to have a meditation that gets you outside of yourself. And so in this other one, it was something like, uh, you know, cotton is fluffy or the sky is blue or the grass is, the grass smells good. So it was just contemplating some other thing outside of my own body. So they had the spiritual meditation, the internal secular meditation, the external secular meditation and the relaxation technique. And again, they found uh, actually all of them could improve uh, the ability to uh, keep your hand in that ice bath. Although the spiritual meditation um, markedly, uh, um, uh, was markedly uh, higher than the other groups. Then they took this same training and applied it to a group of migraineurs, so people who suffer regularly from migraine headaches. <clears throat> and interestingly, they found all of these techniques did help reduce the number of headaches in these uh, migraineurs, uh, but the spiritual meditation had the greatest reduction in the number of headaches uh, per month. <clears throat> They also then looked at these uh, migraineurs' use of their migraine medications, and so you can see the dark line at the bottom is the spiritual meditation group compared to the other forms of meditation, and the spiritual meditation group was able to substantially uh, um, have a, a lower uh, use of their regular migraine medications than the other meditation groups. All right, uh, flipping now to uh, what we kind of, I sort of say, is the big kahuna of um, epidemiologic research, which is all-cause mortality, uh, one of, we think, kind of the most robust outcome measures uh, when looking at different predictors of um, um, bad outcomes, all-cause death. <clears throat> uh, 
Um, here is one of the earliest studies on this, a prospective cohort study of life expectancy at the age of 20 um, by race and by religious attendance. <clears throat> and so first off, you see kind of in the never uh, attending, you know, religious services and, and whites versus blacks and actually in, in, uh, in, in the less frequent uh, attendance, you see big disparities by the races. We know this, there's, there's, uh, this is an ongoing area and, uh, of great interest and um, um, efforts in, on the part of public health to try and uh, eliminate and decrease these disparities. <clears throat> but you can see that both groups um, have increased uh, life expectancy um, over, <clears throat> over this prospective study um, based on their uh, starting point of um, uh, uh, never versus infrequent versus frequent uh, religious service attendance. <clears throat> and in fact, and, and those disparities start to diminish between whites and blacks when you uh, get out to the uh, more frequent attendance. Um, and this study found that on average, uh, that uh, whites experienced about seven years of greater uh, life expectancy and uh, um, African-Americans experienced 14 years of uh, longer life um, with more uh, um, frequent uh, religious attendance. Um, Koenig, again, back in his systematic review in 2012, <clears throat> looked at about 121 studies through, 20, through 2010. So this data is uh, almost, almost a decade and a half old. Most of these were prospective cohort studies, so higher quality studies. 68% of these studies found that religious practice was associated with decreased mortality. 63 of these studies were considered methodologically rigorous, and meaning they adjusted well for confounders. The um, the association was higher in those more methodologically rigorous studies. Average mortality reduction was about 37%. Now, uh, more recently, uh, Dr. Vanderweel has started to look at this with some of these better uh, long-term cohort studies. This one's called the Black Women's Health Study that's been following a, a little over 36,000 African-American women here from 2005 to 2013. And so, again, looking at uh, uh, religious engagement or religious practice with none versus infrequent versus somewhat frequent versus very frequent religious attendance and mortality reduction <clears throat> in these different groups over time. Um, here he adjusted for just about everything you can potentially think of that might affect uh, uh, mortality. <clears throat> so uh, he, as I said, he brings a very uh, rigorous uh, research methodology in trying to um, uh, adjust for confounders. <clears throat> And here, this was about a 36% reduction in mortality in those that were more religiously engaged. Um, did the same kind of analysis in the nurses' health study. Uh, here, uh, 74,000 uh, women over 16 years. And again, a substantial uh, reduction in uh, mortality. Um, this reduction was about 33% in the nurses who, at the beginning of the 16-year study, were identified as more frequent religious um, uh, attenders. If they persisted in their religious attendance through the 16 years of follow-up, that uh, mortality benefit was even more. It was about 50% reduction in mortality. I try to think about like the different things we do in healthcare to try and inter intervene and increase life expectancy, decrease mortality. And there's very few things that um, uh, predict this uh, large of differences. <clears throat> Uh, for example, all-cause mortality reduction when we give statins to lower LDL is about 9%. Um, controlling hypertension gives you about a 24% reduction in all-cause mortality. Uh, so, you know, those are some of our better things that we're able to do in, in ameliorating risk factors for death. And if you kind of look at this kind of on balance, uh, frequent religious attendance is about equivalent to people who have very healthy eating habits and uh, reg regularly exercise vigorously or about the same effect as looking at never smokers versus uh, moderate to heavy smokers. <clears throat> now, uh, Dr. Vanderweel's group um, um, uh, did an update of, of this uh, research uh, literature review, and they, um, they brought together uh, a systematic review applying the Cochrane uh, methodology. So the Cochrane group brings what is considered the highest research uh, methodology for evidence-based medicine. And they applied Cochrane standards to uh, a more updated review of uh, the literature on these connections between spirituality and uh, serious illness and health. <clears throat> and they also uh, followed that up with what's called a Delphi panel, which is a method of bringing together experts and having them review this systematic review to make then um, statements on evidence quality and, and recommendations. And the Delphi 
technique uh, is again uh, a method to try and uh, uh, decrease um, bias and um, uh, improve uh, the methodologic rigor. <clears throat> what did they find in their systematic review uh, of which I just showed you only a very small smattering of some of the studies? They came out with eight statements, this again published in JAMA, Journal of American Medical Association recently, eight statements with strong evidence quality regarding the association of frequent service attendance and health outcomes. Lower mortality, a dose response association with attendance and lower mortality, less use of smoking, alcohol, marijuana, illicit drug use, better measures of quality of life and life satisfaction, better mental health, fewer depressive symptoms, fewer suicidal behaviors, and in adolescence, less risky sexual behaviors, less smoking, reduced alcohol and marijuana and illicit drug use. Um, they also came out with eight statements with strong evidence quality regarding spirituality and serious illness, which I'll touch on more towards the end. Um, notably, spirituality uh, in, in their review was found to be important to most patients with serious illness, about 71 to 99% identifying this as being important, that spiritual, <clears throat> spiritual needs are common in the setting of serious illness, spiritual care is frequently desired, um, spirituality can actually influence, influence medical decision making, often in a very positive way from the perspective of healthcare, which I could go into uh, in the Q&A if people are interested. Um, provision of spiritual uh, care is associated with better end of life outcomes. Spiritual needs are frequently unaddressed. Spiritual care is rarely offered and unaddressed spiritual needs are associated with poorer patient quality of life. Well, going back to the evidence quality here regarding the association of service attendance and health outcomes, <clears throat> I think it sort of begs the question is, how do we explain this? Why is this? Now, there are a number of different um, uh, propositions as to why this may be. So uh, it's, it's typically looked at as, as to what are the potential mediators between improved health, well-being, and spirituality. So uh, um, th this list all has um, been studied in one way or another. There have actually been metrics that have been developed, believe it or not, to measure gratitude and altruism, and humility and hopefulness. And many of these metrics have been validated in uh, subsequent studies. And, and so these have all been studied in one form or another. In the interest of time, I'm only going to go over these four uh, on the left here. So healthy habits is kind of the most obvious one that if you, if you are more uh, likely to be engaged in religious community and religious practice, you're, you're probably less likely to smoke, drink, engage in high-risk sexual behaviors, et cetera. <clears throat> uh, but um, in almost all the research I just showed you, uh, that is adjusted for right, right out, out of the bat. So the, the benefits that I recently talked about are beyond the healthy habits. Healthy habits account for a, a, a big chunk at the outset, but there is something beyond that. The next area that's uh, most often talked about is social connections or social connectedness. <clears throat> This is clearly a very important area. There's a, a very rich body of research that shows that the deeper and wider a network of relationships we have amongst both family and friends and our social networks, the better off you are, uh, both mentally and physically. <clears throat> and of course, religious community obviously offers a, that potential uh, network of social connections. Um, interestingly, uh, when this is tried to, I'm just going to show one study here. There are a number of, of, of studies trying to attempt to look at this. When you look at um, uh, different forms of social support uh, versus uh, religious uh, community, um, there does appear to be some differences. So this was a study that looked at six month risk of death after open heart surgery. So, you know, how often do people go on to die? In, in the first six months after their open heart surgery. And they, they developed a metric for what they call group participation, which is how, how connected you are to various uh, uh, networks of family, friends, and, and groups. Um, and then uh, how much uh, do you have uh, for religious strength and comfort? And one of the aspects of uh, which was religious community and others were like uh, religious coping uh, and, and so on. They found that the group that had really uh, very low or no uh, significant uh, uh, strong social networks and no religious strength uh, and comfort had, a, had the highest mortality, almost a, almost a 20% six-month mortality. In those that had uh, uh, fairly high measures of group participation, but really no religious strength and comfort, had a substantially lower uh, risk of death in that six months. Similarly, people who had uh, kind of high religious strength and comfort, but but actually rated lower on the group participation uh, in, in the richness of networks had a similar a lower mortality. 
But the group that was able to answer uh, uh, with high uh, scores for both high group participation and high religious strength had by far the lowest mortality of all. Uh, so there does appear to be some differences um, um, here. Another aspect that I think is worth talking about is uh, the idea, uh, the notion of forgiveness. So if you look at the, again, uh, the kind of research literature, academic publications and PubMed with forgiveness in the abstract or title from 1996 to 2022, again, a kind of a, a marked increase in the number of studies looking at this uh, association between particularly mental health and the notion of forgiveness. <clears throat> this is just some of that research here. Uh, religious practice um, and belief correlate strongly with the propensity to forgive. As we know in, in the Christian tradition, it's a command, it's a admonition uh, uh, that um, Christians are supposed to follow. I'm, I'm less knowledgeable about other faith traditions and would be very interested to learn about that in other faith traditions on, on, on how they look upon for forgiveness. But um, uh, most of these studies have tended to be in uh, uh, the Christian traditions. Um, people who are more forgiving suffer less depression, anxiety, problems managing their diabetes and have higher quality of life measures. Vanderweel's group uh, found that uh, lower depression, lower anxiety, and higher likelihood of multiple measures of psychosocial well-being in two prospective groups, the Nurses Health Study and uh, another one called the Growing Up Today Study. <clears throat> and, and this was forgiveness in, in association with these things. And psychotherapeutic interventions are now being increasingly used and designed to promote forgiveness. Um, and when done, those have been shown to improve depression and anxiety and forgive in, in its victims. Let's point out a couple of notable things from uh, um, you know, the past, a couple of horrific uh, um, uh, mass uh, uh, shootings. One was Dylan Roof uh, in 2015. Some of you may remember this uh, young man, a white supremacist, uh, walked into a, an African-American church um, where they were uh, holding a, a Bible study. Uh, the members of this church and Bible study welcomed him, welcomed him into their group, and he sat with them for a while. Um, and then he pulled out a gun and uh, killed, uh, I believe it was nine of them, <clears throat> um, kind of in cold blood. Um, another tragic story was, uh, some of you may remember in 2006, uh, a man entered an Amish school uh, where he uh, sent all of the boys out of the school and then bound the girls and shot 10 of them, shocking this community, a, a very, very, very devastating, um, uh, horrific act of violence, and then pulled, put the gun to himself and killed himself. Um, when Dylan Roof was at his trial, many members of this congregation and family members of the uh, slain victims uh, came to the trial. And when they were, they had the opportunity to speak. <clears throat> um, and uh, many of them told them, uh, told Dylan Roof that they forgave him. Um, in a similar act, the Amish community <clears throat> that suffered this horrific act of violence reached out to the mother of the shooter and told her that they forgave her son and embraced her, <clears throat> as they said, as a friend. Both of these communities said that this act was extremely hard for them and something that they continue to work on even a decade or more later, um, but, but a powerful uh, example of um, these faith communities um, in, in acting out uh, this forgiveness. Uh, another aspect here is uh, the idea of purpose and meaning in one's life. <clears throat> so, uh, Mark Twain, in his usual pithy manner, said the two most important days in your life are the day you were born and the day you find out why. <clears throat> so um, uh, the major faith traditions in the world offer uh, frequently a transcendent why as to uh, you know, wh why I'm here or what is my purpose. Christianity uh, um, offers union with the divine through faith in Christ. Islam, uh, and I may be getting some of these wrong, and I'm happy to hear more from people of these other faith traditions, um, but Islam, complete peace through true worship and submission to the one God. Judaism, uh, the idea of what's called tikkun olam, which is fulfilling uh, the mission God gave his people through the Torah. And Hinduism through the practices of dharma, artha, karma, <clears throat> uh, which is um, uh, practicing virtue, um, uh, working towards uh, prosperity, karma, sort of uh, cosmic justice, if you will ultimately achieving moksha, which is released from the endless cycle of um, uh, birth, suffering, death, and, and rebirth to ultimate union with the divine. <clears throat> um, when this is actually looked at, um, there are, again, a metrics and, uh, um, that have been developed to try and uh, measure um, purpose in one's life. This was a study um, looking at uh, 
uh, soon to be or uh, already retirees. Um, <clears throat> and uh, again, prospective cohort study, a little bit uh, stronger study design. Uh, and, and breaking them down by people who had uh, high levels of uh, meaning or purpose in their lives at the beginning of the study, that's in the gold, uh, versus those with uh, the lowest um, uh, measures of meaning or purpose in their life. And again, a substantial uh, mortality risk if people had lower sense of purpose or meaning in their lives over this uh, about, what, uh, uh, six-year uh, study period. Um, that hazard ratio for having a uh, low sense of purpose in one's life uh, increased your mortality risk by about 2.4, which is about the same as being kind of a moderate to heavy smoker over that period of time. <clears throat> so uh, substantial uh, substantial mor mortality risk. Uh, Koenig and his group uh, have uh, proposed a theoretical model for why this might be. <clears throat> so this is a very busy slide, but I'll just try and break down the, the, the main gist of it. And that is that uh, they they posit that so the the source here being belief in or attachment to God begets things like theological virtues, faith, hope, and love, and in particular, public practices and rituals, private practices and rituals, religious commitment, religious experiences, and religious coping. <clears throat> These in turn uh, affect lifestyle cho choices and healthy behaviors. They may affect epigenetics. That's uh, an area yet to be studied more. Uh, but maybe most importantly, they they may beget psychological traits or what are called psychological traits or virtues like forgiveness, honesty, courage, self-discipline, altruism, humility, etc. These then beget uh, positive emotions, social connections, and tamp down negative emotions and mental disorders. And this in turn is posited to maybe decrease, improve immune function, endocrine function, cardiovascular functions, decrease things like inflammation which then begets better physical and mental health. <clears throat> well, is there any evidence for this? In fact, it does look like there may be some evidence for this. This was a study, kind of a lower quality study, what we call a cross-sectional study, but uh, um, uh, interesting um, uh, nonetheless. Uh, this was looking at um, uh, serum levels of interleukin-6, uh, a measure of inflammation in the body, um, by attendance at religious services. And so people who uh, never, almost never attended religious services versus uh, uh, a few times a year or a month to frequent uh, had uh, steadily decreasing levels of interleukin-6 uh, in, in their blood, this measure of inflammation. <clears throat> uh, a better uh, study here, which uh, was from the, uh, the center that researches this at the University of Michigan, uh, they did what was called the Landmark Study of Spirituality and Health. Uh, one of the aspects was looking at a subset of older adults that had higher than median life stressors, like recent loss of a spouse or a major medical issue or a financial uh, um, uh, tragedy. <clears throat> they found in these people with uh, these high life stressors um, that there was a 38% lower likelihood of having an elevated C-reactive protein, which is another measure of inflammation in the body, an inflammatory marker, in subjects that attended religious service, uh, services at least uh, one or more times a month. Um, the decreased likelihood remained after adjusting for age, gender, education, BMI, smoking, alcohol use, and social support. Only religious attendance predicted the lowered CRP. Interestingly, uh, it was not predicted by private prayer, religious meaning, religious hope, general meaning, general hope, or sense of peace. It was, it was uh, getting out and, and, and being engaged in religious, uh, that religious community. Uh, another line of research that started to pop up um, is uh, looking at sort of cellular aging. So you, you can uh, get a sense of um, cellular aging by what are, what's called telomere length. Telomeres are the cap at the end of our chromosomes that are responsible for mitosis or dividing the chromosomes when cells divide. Uh, younger cells have longer telomeres. Older cells have shorter telomeres. <clears throat> Uh, and so it's a it's a measure of sort of uh, cellular aging. In this cross-sectional study, again, not one of the highest quality studies, um, but uh, interesting, uh, they looked at telomere length uh, as a, a function of religiosity. And those with the highest, being one standard deviation beyond the mean of religiosity or, or engagement in religious practice, had the longest telomeres. <clears throat> those with the least uh, um, religious engagement had the shortest telomeres um, or uh, 
uh, in increased measure of cellular aging. This was adjusted for uh, religious support, religious coping, age, gender, race, education, et cetera, et cetera. You can kind of read through these here. So an, an attempt to try and adjust for numerous con confounders. This uh, line of evidence has been repeated and found in about uh, probably four or five other uh, kind of similar, you know, low to medium quality studies, cross-sectional studies, and now has been validated in one uh, larger prospective uh, study. All right, kind of getting close to kind of uh, the end here and in, in my last point. So kind of walking through again, some of these proposed mediators for these uh, positive associations between uh, religion or religiosity and health. Um, again, connectedness, purpose, forgiveness, gratitude, healthy habits, hope, altruism. I didn't go into all of these. Um, I think it, it, it's obvious to say that you do not need to be a religious person to have social connections, to have purpose in your life, to be a forgiving person, to be a grateful person, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> and in fact, um, I think we can all start readily calling to mind you know, the, the sort of religious person or the holier than thou person who, you know, is, is particularly in our mind, uh, not very grateful or not very forgiving. Um, and we may call to mind that uh, friend or family member or colleague um, who doesn't have particular religious practice or beliefs, who is a very grateful or very connected or um, very hopeful or altruistic person. So you don't have to have that. <laughs> but I think we need to acknowledge that um, religious practice does tend to package these things together. <laughs> um, um, sorry, that was uh, um, speeding up my little animation here. So if you um, if you look at, at people who are engaged religiously, um, th these these different attributes do tend to correlate strongly. And this again, another Koenig review uh, looked at the the research literature on. Uh, connections between religious involvement and these mediating attributes, social support, positive emotions, greater purpose and meaning life, greater sense of hope, uh, forgiveness, altruism, volunteering, and gratitude, and very, very strong associations between people uh, who uh, um, uh, are regularly engaged in religious practice and these different potential mediating uh, factors. Um, I do think it's important to acknowledge that not everything is uh, positive. So there are some negative correlations with health and religion. Um, so one that's been found uh, in, in several studies is what's called extrinsic religiosity. Those, so th this would be people who um, sort of say that they they are in a religious community because of you know the social benefits that it gives and that it's it's maybe um, socially expedient for them to to do this. Um, it's not necessarily. Um, part and parcel to their worldview or their beliefs. Um, there is a particular group in some of the survey data uh, uh, of people who identify as, quote, spiritual but not religious. And that that actually that sort of uh, survey, uh, uh, plucked out survey uh, question <clears throat> or answer, if you will, has been associated with some negative correlates of, uh, of um, mental and physical health. People who are spiritually struggling God has abandoned me. God doesn't love me. God has left me. Um, have uh, their strong associations with negative uh, um, aspects of health. Some of the more fundamentalist religions and, and some and some of the mental health uh, measures um, uh, may have a, a negative correlation. Religions that uh, eschew healthcare, meaning they only rely on uh, prayer or faith and and uh, not going to the doctor or not um, uh, seeking healthcare. Uh, may have uh, negative health outcomes. Um, there are some studies that show religious minorities. So if you're a minority in a country where particularly uh, that minority may be um, oppressed, uh, can have negative correlates uh, on, on health, particularly mental health. And there have been, uh, it's kind of a mixed picture, but there have been some studies that show that people uh, come from the LGBTQ communities and past associations with some religious groups uh, may predict um, some negative mental health. That does turn out to be a, a mixed picture. There are other studies that show uh, people from LGBTQ communities that are engaged in um, religious community and religious practice do see many, if not most, of the health benefits that I've talked about um, um, uh, previously. All right, what are what are the implications of this? So uh, first, um, some of the public health implications. <clears throat> um, I, I think we need to be aware that um, there is a, a real shift in uh, the sort of religious landscape in the United States 
um, uh, one of which is uh, often frequently talked about is the rise of the nuns, N-O-N-E, that is um, people who claim no religious affiliation. This started to increase in the early 1990s and has been steadily increasing, particularly amongst the younger uh, age groups. <clears throat> uh, so especially kind of seen in the millennials and beyond, um, claiming no uh, religious affiliation. Um, uh, the Jewish uh, writer and sociologist and intellectual Will Herberg, you know, made the statement that man is, quote, homo religiosus, by nature religious. As much as he needs food to eat or air to breathe, he needs a faith for living. Um, now, uh, there, there are people that might take issue with that, but there are uh, some um, interesting kind of findings that may support this to some extent. If you look at the Pew Research Center <clears throat> um, in, in their survey of religious belief in America, even those who uh, are agnostic or say their religion is, quotes nothing in particular, um, um, most of those believe in a higher power spiritual force. If you take the sort of nothing in particular, uh, about 90%. Uh, believe in God as described in the Bible or believe in an other higher power or spiritual force. Uh, if you look at the religiously unaffiliated, about 72% will say they believe in God described in the Bible or, or this higher power or spiritual force. Um, agnostics, um, up to 67% uh, will claim this. And even atheists, 18% uh, in the Pew survey, uh, have some belief in uh, a higher power or spiritual force. <clears throat> um, our our former kind of star psychologist uh, at NDSU, Dr. Clay Rutledge, who uh, a few years ago uh, moved on to uh, other things. Now he's the VP of Research and Director of the Human Flourishing Lab at the Archbridge Institute. He was a bit of a rock star for us when he was at NDSU. He was frequently on CNN and New York Times and Washington Post and um, other places for his research in social psychology. And he uh, um, explored several kinds of um, aspects of this. He calls himself now an existential psychologist. In, in Dr. Rutledge's, I'm borrowing one of his slides from a lecture I attended uh, of his here, um, he, he noted in, in, in the survey research and in his own research, the steady decline in what we might call mainstream or, or if you will, orthodox uh, religious practice, um, main, mainstream uh, Christianity, Judaism, etc. Um, there is a steady decline in uh, that attendance in religious practice. But it is not being replaced by sort of a uh, you know materialist world, materialist atheist worldview. It's actually uh, being replaced by an increasing belief in what he would call the paranormal. So belief in UFOs, ghosts, astrology, or a spiritual force, sort of a, a more amorphous spiritual force or or kind of a higher power out there. Um, and, but Dr. Rutledge um, notes in, in his uh, book, uh, kind of uh, compiling a lot of this research on uh, supernatural death, meaning, and the power of the invisible world, he states that it's not enough to make life longer, easier, or even more pleasurable. People need to feel that they matter, that they are meaningful members of a meaningful, meaningful social world. Not all beliefs in the supernatural or paranormal help to fulfill this need equally. Um, the U.S. Surgeon General released a report, a report last year called Our Epidemic of Loneliness and Isolation. Um, I, I highly encourage you to look at this if you're working in public health. It's an epidemic, and it's a big problem, and it confers a lot of uh, negative health attributes. Um, we all know uh, the research literature that shows that our increased use of social media and our devices has not connected us uh, more to other people. It's done the opposite. It has atomized us and uh, uh, led to more loneliness and more isolation. And we, we see these, these rise in deaths of despair and suicides in the U.S. that are now at, at historic levels. Um, Dr. Vanderweel, in an uh, editorial in uh, Journal of the American Medical Association of Psychiatry, noted this increase in the number of annual suicides <clears throat> in the last decade or so. And he estimates that uh, up to 40 percent of the recent increases in suicide rates might be attributed to the decline in religious service attendance and the loss of that protective effect that we see from numerous uh, studies that I showed you earlier um, uh, and that association with decreased risk of, of suicide. Um, so what are some of the uh, recommendations from a public health perspective? Um, Dr. Uh, Doug Ullman with a foreword by Sandro Galea. So uh, Dr. Ullman is a, a professor at UC Berkeley in the Department of Public Health. Sandra Galea is the, uh, I think, Dean of uh, Public Health at Harvard. Um, and uh, did I get that wrong? Boston University. Boston, okay. sorry, Boston, sorry. <laughs> um, 
uh, they, they have a book on why religion and spirituality matter for public health. They, at Berkeley, they actually teach a course on this. Um, some of their, uh, uh, Dr. Oman's posits are that we should, we, we have to stop ignoring the elephant in the room, these associations uh, that are, are increasingly being recognized as uh, robust. Um, we should be looking how, at ways that we can foster public health and faith community collaborations. Uh, we should be developing educational materials and curricula for teaching in the health professions. Um, we need more longitudinal studies that better assess the mediating factors. And we need more studies for non-Abrahamic faith traditions in non-Western countries, and perhaps more comparative studies uh, on faith traditions and these um, effects. There are other textbooks out there on this that are being used in some curricula now being taught in some medical schools and public health schools. Um, <clears throat> uh, Dr. Vanderweel's uh, group, again, in that same paper, came out with their uh, evidence-based recommendations uh, from their Delphi panel. Their top ranked suggestions for implications in of religion, spirituality, uh, and, and health outcomes were that we need to have an increased awareness among health professionals of the evidence for the protective health associations and spiritual community. We should be incorporating patient-centered and evidence-based approaches regarding these associations. And we need to recognize spirituality as a social factor associated with health in research, our community assessments, and in program implementation. Um, for medical care, uh, they recommend incorporating spiritual care into the care of patients with serious illness, that we should incorporate spiritual care education and training of interdisciplinary teams caring for patients with serious, serious illness, and including specialty practitioners of spiritual care, our chaplains and our healthcare professionals that, that are, in, um, uh, that are in, in the chaplaincy um, as part of our uh, uh, care of patients. <clears throat> Um, I, I would add to this uh, for medical practice, I think for all healthcare workers, regardless of one's personal beliefs, we should recognize that the majority of uh, our patients have a spiritual life that they want to be addressed and integrated with their healthcare. We should learn how to, at, at a bare minimum, take a spiritual history and probe connections with significant social history. It's a very important social determinant of health. Um, ask if the patient would like involvement of their clergy or hospital chaplain, um, encouraging uh, patients to engage their spiritual resources in the management of their illness, including faith, community, spiritual meditation, and prayer. <clears throat> um, uh, one of the tools that's been proposed for this is called the FICA tool, which uh, uh, asks about uh, faith, its importance to you, what kind of faith community do you have, and how would you like this addressed in your care? And it gives the, you know, the questions that can be used at a very simple tool that can be part of uh, social history. Um, it is, of course, inappropriate to prescribe religion. Religion should not be sort of mercenary for, you know, I'll, I'll do this because it might make my mental health or my physical health better. It should be, because, I think, and any clergy that attending, I think, would not want people kind of approaching it from that sort of very uh, mercenary approach. Um, however, encouragement of those who are religiously inclined to engage in their faith community, I think, is a very reasonable uh, approach for practitioners, uh, given its known benefits. And for patients who are non-spiritual, uh, we, we should be exploring and encouraging the development of, of these mediating factors where appropriate. What can give their life meaning? How can they improve their social connections? Do they need to look at forgiveness or gratitude or humility or mindfulness or these other potential mediating factors in their own lives, regardless of one's spiritual beliefs? I'll finish with a quote from Sir William Osler. He's one of the uh, founding uh, fathers of Johns Hopkins University. He's kind of considered the father of internal medicine. His textbook uh, in the early 1900s of internal medicine still stands uh, the test of time. We were taught many, many of his precepts in my internal medicine residency training. And he stated that nothing in life is more wonderful than faith, the one great moving force which we can neither weigh in the balance nor test in the crucible. <clears throat> so I'll stop there for questions. Uh, sorry, I think I did. Uh, well, I came pretty close here. Um, uh, but I'm happy to stay on a little bit longer for people uh, if they uh, have questions. Oh, thank you, Dr. Carson. This was fantastic, as evidenced by our large crowd. Um, and we definitely appreciate the presentation today. I want to tell our viewers, listeners, that this presentation will be available uh, on the College of Health Professions and Human Sciences YouTube page. And all persons who have registered will receive that link so you can go and view it later. It, out of respect for your time, if you're using your lunch time, lunch break to listen or whatever, we'd like to now officially end the presentation. And so you're free to to leave and I give you that permission. But I also wanted to let you know that Dr. Carson will stay around for about 15 minutes to entertain the questions that have been posed in the chat. So either way, uh, we'll carry on. 
And for those of you who have to dismiss yourself, that, that's fine. And thank you for being here. So in the chat, we have a few questions and I'll read them. So any role of the different, I think you might have addressed this, but the different religions. So is it work the same for any religion in a sense? Yeah. So uh, the vast majority of the research has been uh, kind of in the West and with uh, Christian faith tradition, but there is a growing uh, body of uh, actually pretty good quality research that's coming out of uh, some uh, Muslim countries, particularly Iran. Um, there, very, very similar outcomes are seen uh, as well. Um, uh, one, one of the studies uh, I just uh, looked at that was uh, another study on this telomere length looked at actually uh, Muslim minority in China, uh, finding this same association with telomere length in that population uh, who are engaged uh, more strongly uh, in their um, uh, Muslim community and practice. Uh, so it does uh, hold up. There's less um, uh, less data uh, um, from uh, s some of the um, uh, uh, Asian uh, countries and faith traditions there, Hinduism, Buddhism, um, and so on, although a desire, I think, uh, on a lot of the people researching this to look at this as well. The next question was, are sects and cults religious? And I think the implication was the harmfulness that comes along with sects and cults. Yeah, uh, that probably would be a, a good addition to um, uh, 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 the, the sort of list where there may, may be harm. Um, the word cult, uh, um, you know, ha has a, 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 a language derivation that goes uh, much further back than what I think the, the questioner is asking about. So cult uh, often uh, means just a, a following a, a certain um, uh, set of religious practices or or, or beliefs. In, in the more modern parlance that I think the, the questioner is talking about uh, has more to pertaining to sort of the charismatic figure who leads, you know, a small to moderate sized group of people in what, what might be considered a very alternative uh, uh, path. And um, I don't think that that's been studied in with the same health, health outcomes in any way, although we know some of the sort of terrible outcomes that have come from some uh, cult followings, and I, I uh, and so I, I don't think these things would pertain to to that as well, and that would be uh, most likely a negative association. Okay, Michael Dulitz cited Mormon's book Meaning, Medicine, and the Placebo Effect to argue that the interface between religion and health is the meaning derived between the relationship between the patient and the provider. Uh, would you support that, or do you see that as a part of this? I'm not sure I understand the question provider so you mean the person the provider of the religion so you mean between like it's based on the meaning between uh i don't know for sure if michael is here perhaps you could clarify your question he may have had to slip away okay uh, i'm not quite sure on yeah that. so i i think that um you know religious practice uh, uh um you know what? What is mediating that that effect? There are some positive psychological attributes that I think the, the thought being, you know, affects us, you know, mentally in such a way that it actually affects things like our endocrine function, immune function, um, inflammatory markers, uh, and, and all of that. Now, whether you call that a placebo effect or not, I mean, I, you know, the men there's a mental effect. Um, we know placebo effect can be a very real thing, but this is conferred by this practice. I, I don't know that I would call it placebo. I mean, it's, you're not taking a drug, you're not taking a therapeutic intervention, and it's um, it's it's a way of sort of approaching your life uh, and, and, and the way you live and the way you practice. Mm -hmm. The next question was whether to distinguish between spirituality and religiosity or not, because you ended up with the RS sort yeah. of cluster, yeah. but is there a distinction or any yeah. thoughts about that? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think to, to be fair to this, the vast majority uh, of the evidence showing the positive associations is around religiosity, not spirituality. There are some studies that show religious coping, um, engagement of my sort of spiritual resources can help me with certain things, but like the mortality benefits, the um, uh, the a lot of the mental health, the, the more striking uh mental health health benefits like suicide risk that is all religiosity so spirituality is not uh, and, and we could talk about why that may might be uh but but to be fair they that doesn't need to be teased apart and it's in and, and most of the research is on religiosity 
Um, one of the areas of further investigation is trying to parse that out further and understand is is do these other things like spirituality, religious coping, et cetera, uh, mediate similar effects. And that's an interesting one because when you showed your graph of sort of religious trajectory trends, lower religiosity, and then I know you use like the extraterrestrial or whatever, but I think that would be suggesting spirituality, right? So right. it could be that some of the loss in religious, re religiosity is being replaced by spirituality. So then the question whether it can get the same effect is of interest. Any thoughts on that? Is that a possible um, you know, I didn't, going on or? Yeah, I didn't show uh, the, so there's, this is just started, starting to be explored a little bit. I didn't show the day I could put up the graphs if you like, but um, for example, there was one study that looked at uh, a, a very good, good study. This was longitudinal prospective cohort study called the National Study of Youth and Religion. I looked at them from 2005 to 2008 and broke them down into uh, um, young people who were consistently religious who were consistently spiritual, but not religious, meaning that's how they answered the, the way they identified themselves as spiritual, not religious, or whether they flipped from spiritual, not religious to becoming uh, religious or flipped from um, uh, being religious to becoming spiritual, but not religious. Um, there was both increased risk of depression in those who were consistently spiritual, but not religious or flipped to being spiritual, but not religious um, and increased um uh, let's see, the other one was increased uh, um, uh, less likelihood of uh, identifying themselves as being in excellent health um, based on uh, um, uh, that category. Uh, that's one, one of the studies that I've seen that sort of tried to directly address that category. I think that needs to be studied and parsed out though a lot further. And it kind of gets, I think, to what Dr. Rutledge was saying is that not all sort of spiritual beliefs um, are, are likely to mediate uh, um, uh, some of these effects or give the same sort of levels of purpose and meaning in one's life. Okay, the next question is from Ethan uh, Sakuridis, who also, by the way, said, that was an amazing seminar. Wow. But one of his questions was um, the role of social determinants of health and health equity. And if there's any you know, use the, the book that talks about religion as a social determinant of health, but what about the broader basket of social determinants of health? And is there any relationship there? I, I, great question. Uh, not something that I've seen sort of explored, um, you know, that the, those interactions. I, you know, when I, I was talking to a friend of mine, very smart guy who, who was, uh, I was telling him about the seminar I was going to give, and I was telling him a little bit about, you know, some of these mediating factors. <clears throat> One of the things he he suggested, and I, I thought was a, a very interesting observation that I think is worth studying, is he said, you know, what is the social capital one gains by being in a religious community? You sit in a pew with sort of the wealthy and the connected and, you know, uh, upper middle class, and right next to you may be the person who's uh, much less um, uh, connected, uh, poor, et cetera. And, and sort of in the eyes of your faith, you, you are all equal. <clears throat> Um, what does that do in, in sort of sort of cross pollination between um, you know uh, sort of haves or haves nots and, and and disparities that we kind of see there? And I, I thought that was a very interesting um, uh, thought and observation that probably is worth exploring. I, I think these need need to be explored further. I think it's interesting seeing the sort of race and ethnicity breakdown of sort of belief and 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 religious coping in, in those different groups um, and as a potential means to. Uh, um, decrease uh, some of those disparities. Um, but I, I appreciate the question. I think that warrants a lot further exploration. And one of my purposes of this talk today is there's a lot of people on here who are in academia and in public health. I'd, I'd love to see it taken for, I don't, you know, I'm, I've just kind of collected this stuff. Um, I would love to see people who actually think and work in this area a lot more ponder like where this goes next. Mm -hmm. um, another question had to do with a seeming further extremism among religious persons regarding certain cultural values. And, um, and one of them obviously would be opposition to abortion as an example, which public health would perceive as a right and a, and a value. Um, but then along with it are certain other, you know, anti-vaccination potentially. So without getting into the contentious issues of abortion and vaccination per se, but is there any concern that there might be sort of extremist views within religiosity, which might end up having harmful consequences, if even not at the end, that individual person's level, but at the population of which they're a part because of the 
kind of demand or expectation placed on them regarding those issues. Any thoughts on that? Uh, a few. Um, so uh, I'll just touch on on sort of skirt uh, kind of the, the abortion question. And I, I, I encourage you to look. Dr. Vanderweel actually wrote a really interesting editorial on this. Uh, I think it was again at JAMA um, on, on sort of this question around the abortion issue. And he, he points out that um, sort of the, the research on sort of mental health benefits, mental health harms, physical benefits, physical harms around abortion legislation, uh, restrictions, access, and so on, is almost weaponized by both sides on this issue. And it's, it's very hard to tease out like uh, decent quality research. And, it, and he points out that, look, at the core of this is really uh, um, more values uh, questions and moral and ethics questions. <clears throat> um, and that everyone can come around like uh, and get behind the idea that women need access to good mental health care and should not be restricted and should be supported as much as possible. But the core question there is one of sort of uh, values and morals and, and not sort of like um, these positive, negative, physical. He, he acknowledges that there may be things on either side. It, it's an editorial worth looking at, um, but I don't, this is not going to be uh, uh, settled in, in, in any way, anytime soon. And it's not going to be settled based on the, the sort of public health uh, benefits or lack thereof. Um, the vaccine uh, issue, it, I, I, I'll, I'll hit on directly because we deal with it so much. It's very, very interesting because uh, prior to, I would say COVID, um, our work in sort of overcoming vaccine hesitancy um, really kind of had a lot to do with, uh, if you look at the demographics of, of who was uh, more inclined to be vaccine hesitant, it was college educated, upper middle class, usually identifying more sort of in liberal enclaves. It was sort of the California, Oregon, and Washington, you know, the, the coast, coast, and, and sort of almost a, a matter of privilege for uh, vaccine hesitancy. <clears throat> that is kind of flipped and there's sort of interesting bedfellows now with kind of the other side of the political spectrum where it's now become an, an issue of sort of kind of libertarian body autonomy, you know, um, my body, my choice kind of uh, kind of thinking. Um, I, I think around the vaccine issue, um, it, 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 it particularly with COVID, it got politicized. There's, we could do a whole talk on why that happened, how that happened, whatever it is, it did become politicized. It, it, political affiliation is a, is now a strong predictor of certain attitudes on on vaccine stuff. I think it has more to do with the political side than the actual religious side, although I think that's worth worth teasing out. You can find religious leaders um, uh, that that are strong advocates uh, of vaccination. One of um, we, we've had some success in some of the faith communities reaching out you know, directly to them. But um, that that warrants further teasing out. I, I acknowledge that there may be on the fringes um, uh, of uh, of religious belief, uh, things that may run counter to uh, what are accepted public health goals. Sure. Um, one comment, then I'm going to ask one last question. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a comment, I think it's really affirming what you've been saying, but the correlation between um, Utah's, you know, views on health, substance use and such, and their ex population health outcomes. So I think it's an affirmation of what you've been saying. The last mm -hmm. question I'd like to ask in a kind of a positive note, you suggested that we can't prescribe religion or spirituality on an individual basis. But if you think about it from a public health perspective, is there any role to intervene? So you're not telling an individual what to do, but to intervene like with faith communities to help them even further enhance the impact they might have on improving the health of populations. And we'll have this as our last question for the day. I love your thoughts on this, Dr. Strand. I know you, <laughs> um, um, this is something I've kind of thought about. I, I think for, for first off is that um, it's not to look at, at, at faith communities as sort of the enemy. Uh, th these are, I think, potential strong partners um, uh, in, in advocating, you know, similar goals and, and uh, likely strong partners in, in good health outcomes. I'll, I'll just briefly comment, you know, on one thing we did during the COVID pandemic, we partnered with the a local mosque here in Fargo is one of our most successful vaccine campaigns. We we engaged with the religious leaders there who supported us and brought it out. We had um, a vaccine kind of clinic set up after uh, after their religious service attendance, and it, it was just really a positive, uh, just a wonderful positive thing uh, for us in, in working in that area of public health and, and for that faith community. Um, you, you know, I there's there's the concerns about separation of church and state, appropriately so, uh, but I think uh, there is enough overlap. 
in um, and enough uh, um, mutual goals here that I, I think a lot of work can be done. I, 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 I'm not smart about this. I would love to think and hear from other people like how that may play out further, what might be done. And as part of the reason why I kind of put put this out to this kind of a group. <clears throat> Well, this has been fantastic. And the last comment, I'll just leave it out there, which would be any relationship between American Indian traditional beliefs in the creator and those benefits. And um, and if you want to reply to that, you can. I, I would love to see this looked at in um, in Native American communities and Native spirituality. My sense from what I hear, like from some of the our uh, Native American students who have presented in their public health symposia to us, uh, one that struck me in particular was um, and on some of the practices and rituals that are done in as part of native spirituality really brings to mind that sense of community, that sense of caring for one another. Um, uh, I, I, I strong, I, I know of, I know of at least one study that's looked at this and found again, very positive, uh, at, um, outcomes, uh, in, with the regular engagement or practice of native spirituality. I'd love to see that looked at more. Um, I, I think that's a wide open area uh, of research for um, like our students. Fantastic. Well, thank you for the time. And I appreciate indulging the audience who stayed on for these Q&A discussion. This has been very uh, enhancing of our conversation. Thank you for joining today's NDSU Public Health Seminar. Uh, thank you. And let's take up Dr. Carson's challenge to consider these issues further in the areas that we do work and research. Have a good day, everyone. Bye.